Good afternoon and welcome to the 26th edition of the Center for Comparative Literature's conference. Um, I would like to remind you all to turn off your phones uh, during the talk. And um, I would like to invite Professor Rebecca Comey to introduce in turn Professor W.J.T. Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you, can you hear me? Um, I know everybody always clears their throat and starts this way when introducing famous speakers, but this time it actually is true. The person I'm about to introduce really does need no introduction. Editor and founder of the magnificent and path-breaking journal, Critical Inquiry, so generative for so many of us in the humanities and beyond, Gayford Donnelly Distinguished Service Professor of English and Art History at the University of Chicago, author of an immense array of luminous and prize-winning <coughs> books, multiply translated as well, among which, and I really am just skimming the surface here just to give a flavor of the intellectual range and topicality of his writing, Iconology, Picture Theory, The Last Dinosaur Book, what Do Pictures Want? Claiming Terror, The War of Images, September 11th to Abu, Abu Ghraib. Seeing Through Race, Occupy, a co-authored book called Occupy, Three Essays in Disobedience. Image Science, Iconology, Media Aesthetics, and Visual Culture, all more or less in order of, of appearance. And this is, again, just a, a sampling. The editor of numerous influential essay collections, including Language of Images, On Narrative, um, Against Theory, Art and the Public Sphere, and Landscape and Power. The recipient of numerous awards, including, among many others, the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Philosophical Society, and prizes, including most recently the College Art Association Lifetime Achievement Award for the Teaching of Art History, W.J.T. Mitchell is simply one of the most important and provocative critics of our time. I don't actually know exactly what to call him, a literary theorist, an art critic, a cultural critic, a political commentator, a public intellectual. The home page on Mitchell's own website welcomes visitors with the inviting doormat, welcome to the jungle of the imaginary. And there are some strange beasts in that jungle, including things that talk, dancing tables, and dinosaurs. W.J.T. Mitchell was an utterly inspired choice as keynote speaker for this year's graduate student conference in Complet. The students who put together this wonderful event, and we should really all applaud them, had a stroke of genius when they decided to organize this year's event around a little prefix. The prefix trans speaks not only to the core preoccupations of complet as a discipline, translation, transmediation, transmission, and so on, but also flags some of the most central issues in the university as an institution, as we all struggle to negotiate a way out from under the ossified bureaucratic rubric of interdisciplinarity to a more reflective, more inventive, well, more transformative relation to the idea of disciplinarity as such. And most importantly, the prefix, the prefix speaks to the globalized or transnational world we live in, a time when international no longer seems to capture the massive planetary movement of capital and bodies beyond national borders, or the flip side of that mobility, and it will be relevant, uh, the forcible confinement of whole populations behind borders, fences, and separation walls. It also speaks to one of the most transformative and most rapidly transforming social movements of recent years. I'm, of course, referring to the transgender movement. 
It's hard to assign the exact date when what Peter Osborne has called the war of the prefixes you know, really started taking off, or to date the key battles that marked the turning points in this ongoing war when inter gave way to post and finally to trans. But whenever it was that trans took over as the king of prefixes, W.J.T. Mitchell was already there. He had been there for decades. He was there in 1986 when he published his path-breaking book, Iconology, where he reopened Lessing's 200-year-old question uh, in the Laocoon about the relationship between poetry and painting, that is, between word and image, between seeing and reading. This book not only more or less single-handedly launched the so-called pictorial turn in literary studies, but transformed the discipline of art history, the practice of art criticism, and also shaped artistic practice over the past three decades. Everything exploded when Mitchell rehabilitated that old Renaissance word, iconology. That simple, unhyphenated compound harbored a concatenation and enmeshment and a collision between word and image, picture and thinking, saying and showing. The title did not offer a promise of reconciliation, but rather announced an enigma and a provocation that has continued to fuel Mitchell's work over the past three decades. Mitchell never stops asking about our investment in images. Not simply what we can get out of images, what are we talking about when we talk about images, how is it that our words attach themselves to these seemingly mute objects, but equally, what are images saying? What are they doing? What do they want from us? What do they want us to say? What do they want us to do? The question opens onto concepts we sometimes associate with religion, such as idolatry or an iconoclasm, or with psychoanalysis and Marxism, such as fetishism or ideology. But the point is that images are never simply things to look at. They assume a peculiar sort of agency and pose an ineluctable demand. In other words, images are key sites when oppositions between the human and the inhuman, between the living and the inanimate, between the living and the dead or undead, and between the speaking and the silent or silenced and censored can be troublesome. The stakes are ultimately deeply political, and they've always been high for Mitchell, possibly even increasingly so, at least to judge by some of his more recent titles. Cloning Terror, The War of Images, September 11th to Abu Ghraib, Seeing Through Race, and Occupy, Three Essays in Civil Disobedience. In, in disobedience. In an evocative essay of 2000, Mitchell describes Israel-Palestine as what he calls a work of landscape art in progress. He wasn't offering a mystical meditation on roots and belonging, although he was exploring such discourse, or about landscape as a narrowly aesthetic category. He was actually talking about the nitty-gritty of expropriation, confiscations, house demolitions, olive grove destructions, forcible repopulation, and everything that has been going along with that for several decades. His talk today will reflect upon the specific conditions of image production, or to use his no doubt deliberately double-edged double term, artistic collaboration in such a landscape, and promises to speak to one of the most urgent issues of our day. And so without further ado, I'd like you to all join me in welcoming WJT Mitchell to our conference. Well, 
thank you so much. I mean, this is really going to be anticlimactic now. Uh, <laughs> I, I just want you to keep on going. Uh, the, uh, and I know it's part of the ritual to say how, what an honor it is to be here, but it really, really is. Uh, these halls are haunted by the ghosts of t two of my intellectual heroes, Marshall McLuhan and Northrop Frye, who, when I was a graduate student, if I had been organizing a conference, uh, they, they would have been at the top of the list. Uh, so, um, this, this is kind of a, a sprawling uh, paper which has lost its way. Uh, and that's partly because in a state of crisis, in a state uh, that is um, precarious, uh, unacceptable, uh, sometimes all you can do is make art. And uh, this is something I've found, it's one thing, I've always asked myself, why do I keep going back to Israel, Palestine? I'm neither Jewish, nor Israeli, nor Arab, nor a Christian Palestinian. I'm just an Irish guy. Uh, <laughs> so what am I doing there? And uh, I think the magnetism of it is, how do people live under unbearable uh, conditions and continue to remain human, uh, continue to produce art of the first order, uh, and uh, the second and the third order, because um, this is not about the quality of art uh, in some kind of uh, ahistorical sense. Uh, it's about the emergence of an art of resistance uh, on both sides of the green line, a, a line which, of course, has long since been erased. There is no green line except on old maps. Uh, and it's an attempt to think about the language we could use to describe this situation uh, and the work of artists in the, the situation. Uh, salvaging, for me, is a crucial word here because Israel-Palestine is, is a, in a state of ruins. And uh, you all know there is a new movement in the world, maybe not so new, but that has to do with uh, the art not of celebrating ruins, but of finding something to build out of ruins. Uh, salvage art is a global movement, and it's extremely important in Israel-Palestine. It's also controversial there because some people want to keep the ruins, they want to freeze them. This is a big debate among Palestinians as to whether it really is a good idea to uh, fix up or clean up or rehabilitate. Uh, it's an issue that comes up in um, the, the refugee camps where uh, any attempt to ameliorate life uh, is sometimes regarded with suspicion as what is called normalization. So there are a lot of, there's a lot of language circulating around artistic movements in Israel-Palestine uh, that is filled with toxicity. And one of my attempts here is to try to make some distinctions uh, that will help us use the languages we have the languages I have, uh, it, it, without falling prey to that kind of toxicity. One of them is collaboration. Anybody who's been to Palestine knows that to be declared to be a collaborator it can be a, a, the equivalent of a death sentence. Uh, and yet, and yet, there are forms of collaboration that I want to talk about on both sides uh, that seem to me uh, crucial to pay attention to. Um, so salvaging, uh, collaborative work, and then finally this phrase binational state. Um, I want to emphasize, it, it, I'm not talking about uh, the binational solution uh, or the two-state solution. I am talking about the actually existing state. Uh, in other words, the word state here should be understood to mean something like the situation or the condition, the state of affairs. Uh, which is that there is one state. It's Israel uh, in Israel-Palestine. The Palestinians have no state. Uh, they have an aspirational notion of a state and a nation, uh, but that's what it is, is aspirational. In fact, they are a colonized people, uh, an occupied people, and uh, 
all the rhetoric of, of symmetry between Israel and Palestine, which talks about them as two countries, as if they were at war. Uh, if I don't make anything else clear today, I hope that you would understand what a fraud that entire rhetoric is. We're not talking about two countries at war. We're talking about a colonial uh, conquest and occupation of a people that's been going on now for more than half a century. Um, so you might ask, well, what does it have, always have to do with the trans? And of course, when I was invited, I first, I had a paper that deals with translation and borders and so forth, but I felt like this is uh, in some way uh, better suited for this moment. And then it suddenly hit me in the last few days that the, uh, I want to double the prefix. Uh, instead of just the trans, I want to add the in. So the, the, the substitute title of this paper today is the in trans. Uh, the, and I think we could go through a lot of words, but the two I want to emphasize, the intransigent, uh, the, the negative of the present participle of transigere, to come to an understanding. Uh, we, I'm describing a situation in which that very possibility of coming to an understanding is often blocked, uh, impossible and in which uh, both sides accuse the other of intransigence. Uh, but it's primarily an Israeli word, uh, de declaring that uh, for some reason the sovereign authorities of this non-state uh, called the occupied territories of the West Bank and Gaza, that they are failing to negotiate in good faith. Uh, there's also, by the way, the whole position of the US in this, which is also intransigent in its way, but intransigent in relation to a myth of honest brokerage, that the U.S. is there to uh, be a kind of uh, neutral uh, a partner to a conflict between two peoples, and that uh, somehow we're in a position to do that. The, it couldn't be further from the truth. The U.S. is a dishonest broker, uh, just as intransigent uh, as the Israelis. The other is, uh, intransitivity, the, uh, the kind of predicates that uh, I think of as uh, not running to a place but running in place, like a squirrel in a cage, uh, endlessly running, or I think the best visual metaphor for what's sometimes called the peace process, the Oslo Accords, uh, the claim that we are moving toward a resolution. Uh, uh, the metaphor of the donkey with the carrot in front of it uh, is the right one. It keeps the donkey moving forward, but n they never reach the carrot. So uh, all the movement is intransitive. It never reaches uh, or achieves an object. So uh, what we have is a one state condition with two peoples two peoples that are internally divided in many, many ways. So, uh, Tunis is r right off the bat, a, a, a very bad description. Oneness is actually, I think, more helpful in thinking about what the actual state of affairs is in Israel-Palestine. And one version of that oneness is the notion of greater Israel, which is the, uh, the goal, the object of, a, of many transitive verbs in, uh, uh, within Israel, uh, particularly the Likud party, and that is basically we want one state and we want the Palestinians to leave. It is a policy, a very long-standing policy that started in 1948 of ethnic cleansing, uh, of removal, forced removal of populations. And every once in a while, say, somebody tells it like it is. This is one of the things I find so fascinating about Donald Trump's candidacy uh, in the present election, he, suddenly the uh, unconscious of the Republican Party and an unconscious of a great many uh, American citizens is being expressed quite directly uh, that, that Mexicans are all rapists and murderers and we will build a wall, we will expel all the immigrants. I mean, we have our own uh, ethnic cleansing program going on in, in the U.S. and uh, much of the same rhetoric is, is used. 
So every once in a while, this unconscious is expressed uh, on a, a perfectly uh, vicious and deplorable work of art, namely t-shirt art, uh, in which you can see what the real goal is. Uh, it, it is ethnic cleansing, uh, genocide, really, uh, the murder of uh, a people to prevent reproduction. So uh, a, a pregnant Arab woman is placed in the crosshairs with, with the promise that one shot will achieve two kills. Another, we might say, more documentary and objective picture of the one state condition of Israel-Palestine is this historic map, which shows the shrinkage of territory uh, occupied with any semblance of autonomy, which itself is a complete fabrication, since all of these green areas are under military occupation and can be seized with impunity at any time. Uh, but this, this pretty much gives you the history uh, in, in a graphic form of how the, the Israeli occupation uh, of the West Bank and Gaza has, has proceeded over the years. Uh, Gaza and the West Bank, of course, are very different places. I'll mainly be talking here uh, about the West Bank. I've never been inside Gaza. Very difficult to get in. Uh, so this is the, the framework that I want to invoke for what I'm, uh, what will now be mainly looking at what artists do on both sides. Uh, and I'm going to be talking almost as much about Israeli artists as Palestinian because um, the Israeli artists I admire, I think are doing uh, really terrific work uh, that it, it cannot be classified as kitsch or tourist art uh, for people who want to have a fantasy uh, of what it would be to ha have a Jewish homeland in the Middle East. Uh, so I'll start with uh, a very good friend, Larry Abramson, who uh, made a piece, he actually made this piece for me, it's called Israel's Utopia, and it shows a, uh, a settlement, or a, a single settler's uh, split level suburban home floating in a sea of abstraction. Uh, Larry has written beautifully about the, the the purpose of abstract painting, which is very big in uh, the Israeli art world. And he thinks it's, uh, abstraction is the perfect way to detach yourself from uh, the actual conditions around you. So this is a kind of uh, uh, a satire uh, on the use of abstraction. The green lawn, which of course absolutely toxic to the environment in the, uh, anywhere in the Middle East, but especially in uh, Israel that produces salinization of the water, and then the clear blue sky. Uh, one of Larry's colleagues, a photographer, uh, Mickey Kratzman, shows uh, just exactly the opposite, not the way that abstraction covers up or veils the reality of the world you live in, but uh, in this case, quite precisely, socialist realism. This is a mural that was painted by re recent Russian immigrants who uh, were trained in the technique of socialist realism painting. And so were hired by uh, a settlement uh, near Jerusalem, uh, one of the many uh, uh, illegal uh, settlements in the West Bank. Uh, and it's a trompe l'oeil landscape. So instead of veiling over the environment with abstraction, it, it tries to substitute uh, an illusionary space for the real space. On the far hillside, uh, on the part of the landscape that's real, is uh, a Palestinian village called Bait Jala. Uh, and if you look carefully, you don't see it so much in this frontal view, but in this um, elongated view uh, of the Gilo wall, uh, you can sort of see what the wall is doing. Because the residents of Gilo wanted a, uh, they said, we need a wall for security, but we hate to lose the view. Uh, so the painters were instructed, give us uh, an Arab pastoral. Because we, after all, we do want to live in the Middle East, but we want the fantasy that there are not too many Arabs there. 
Uh, and if you, as you look at it, you can see the actual Beit Jala over the wall, which is a pretty populous town. Uh, it, it, whereas the painting shows a, a kind of Arabian pastoral, uh, a depopulated landscape. Uh, just as a footnote to this, the, uh, the group of painters who did this, uh, who were recent immigrants uh, from, uh, from Russia, uh, said that this whole job, uh, a young Israeli art historian uh, wrote her master's thesis about this, this wall and these painters. And when she interviewed them, they said, making this painting uh, made them feel very sad because they, they thought they had gotten away from socialist realism. Uh, and here they are in, in the promised land and uh, forced to do the same thing again. So they said it was a melancholy job, but they were all broke and they needed the work. So the painters went to work. Uh, and every once in a while they disrupt uh, the, the continuity of the landscape by foregrounding a segment of it. It's, a, it's like a break in a film uh, strip uh, suddenly jumping forward at you. So Mickey Kratzman, he photographs all over uh, Israel, Palestine, uh, and mo his most recent work is in the Negev Desert, where he photographs Bedouin markers. The Bedouins still would prefer a nomadic lifestyle. They come back to the same oases year after year, but now they are, there's an effort by the uh, State of Israel to remove them, to turn them into urban dwellers and workers. Uh, and eliminate their, uh, their, their wandering lifestyle. Uh, their mode of resistance is uh, typical of a nomad. They leave a marker. Uh, the markers are removed within 24 hours by the Israeli army, but uh, not fast enough to elude the, the vigilant Mickey Kratzman, who uh, tracks them down, photographs them, makes sure they're not forgotten. <coughs> Another set of, uh, I think, interesting documentations of the, the real state, the actual state of Israel-Palestine involves documentary film. And I want to show you a series of, uh, of films, starting with this one. Uh, I, I was invited about six years ago to come to Tel Aviv for the annual uh, Tel Aviv University Film Festival. <coughs> and at that uh, they sent me 20 documentary films in advance. And uh, I would say 18 of the films <clears throat> were about the occupation. And these are by Israeli filmmakers. Uh, not so surprising. Filmmakers, especially those who are doing documentary, have this tendency to want to uh, ignore propaganda and cut through to something real. So. I'm going to show you several, just clips, which give you some sense of what these documentaries found out. This one is uh, a clip from a film called What I Saw in Hebron. Uh, Hebron, a city in the uh, eastern part uh, of the West Bank, uh, that has a very tragic and storied history. In 1929, uh, the, uh, the Palestinians rose up and uh, killed uh, about 70 people. Uh, because, uh, and it's as if history uh, just has to compulsively repeat itself, we've heard this again and again, uh, rumors had been spreading all over the uh, occupied territories. Uh, I'm sorry, they weren't occupied then. Uh, the, the occupation was only beginning. European Jews were arriving in Hebron and they had found it. Uh, a school there. But the, uh, the rumor came from Jerusalem uh, that the Jews were going to take over the Temple Mount. Uh, and of course this is a recurrent thing. Every time uh, the, the, this rumor circulates, it produces all kinds of tension. Uh, and there are uh, whole societies and movements inside Israel that think this is the manifest destiny of the State of Israel to tear down the Dome of the Rock and to uh, restore uh, the, uh, the Jewish temple. But this uh, filmmaker um, it, it went back to Hebron uh, to uh, interview the families 
uh, who lived there in the 1920s, the descendants of the families, uh, and brought with him uh, the descendants of some of the Jewish families who had been there. Because it turned out uh, that it wasn't just a massacre. There was also uh, a human salvage operation undergoing, uh, going on at the same time. And uh, many families were protected by their Arab neighbors. And this uh, is a clip that just shows uh, something of that moment. The uh, descendants of these families who were protected uh, recall a time uh, as late as the 1920s when uh, Jews and Palestinians who had lived together for, uh, for centuries in the ancient city of Hebron were what, what they call milk cousins. That is, uh, when a mother's milk did not come in, the baby would be passed over the uh, fence to the neighboring house uh, to be nursed. And so they shared names, they shared mother's milk, uh, they were friends. And so when this uprising occurred, a lot of Arab families risked their lives to protect uh, the, the Jewish community there. Uh, so the, what does this tell us? Uh, it's not, uh, I don't think it's trying to sentimentalize a utopia in the past, but it is uh, suggesting that there was a time when transactions uh, and there was translation, transference, and uh, all kinds of interactions between these communities. Uh, that uh, it, it, there was nothing about this that was grounded in racial hatred. Uh, it, it more had to do, uh, and I can tell you a little anecdote of my first experience. In the 70s, I went to, uh, 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 my wife and I went to Israel, and our hosts, uh, a, a, an American Jewish woman, my wife's best friend, and her new husband, a Sephardic Jew from Libya, uh, were talking about uh, the, the Palestinians. And uh, the question was, why do they hate us so much? And uh, my wife's friend said, well, it's because we're Jews. It's uh, They want to have a Holocaust here in the Middle East. And her husband, Benny, uh, uh, whose native language was Arabic, said, that's nonsense. They don't hate us because we're Jews. They hate us because we stole their land and they're not going to, we're not going to give it back to them. And I thought, they're thinking, who is right here? Uh, the problem is that after 50, 60 years of occupation, uh, the, everyone forgets that. It is because the land was stolen uh, that something like a race hatred uh, can set in. And here's how that hatred looks in another documentary uh, by Yoav Shamir called Checkpoint, which is an hour-long fly-on-the-wall documentary <clears throat> that just did a very simple thing. It went to all of the checkpoints uh, all over Israel and filmed what goes on there. Uh, in addition to the fixed checkpoints, there's a phenomenon there called flying checkpoints. Uh, several hundred per day uh, can spring up anywhere so that if you're traveling to your school, to work, uh, wherever you want to go, 
you never know until the last minute whether there's going to be a checkpoint along the way. But this is uh, a permanent checkpoint, and uh, this gives you some sense of what kinds of things are being said behind the scenes. emphasize that this uh, young man expressing blatantly racist views, they are animals, we're human, uh, is probably a perfectly nice kid, probably around 18 years old, and, uh, but he's expressing something which is, uh, as he says, he's not ashamed to say it. They can show it to the chief of staff for all he cares, uh, because the attitude is basically pervasive and, and acceptable. Uh, among many Israelis, not clearly by this filmmaker who has managed to capture it uh, the way a photographer captured that T-shirt I showed you earlier. But this kind of uh, behavior uh, from a, a young man who's probably perfectly nice in every other way uh, is one reason why another documentary was made called For My Children, <coughs> which was, um, I'm not going to show you, but involves a debate between a husband and wife about whether they should leave Israel. They're middle class Israelis. They could go back to the United States uh, and take up residence in San Francisco. Uh, and the reason they're struggling uh, over this is because their children are approaching military age. They're 15 and 16 years old. And the father is saying, it would be one thing if our children were going to be at risk of their lives to defend our country from an invasion. But staffing this occupation is morally corrupting to them. It, it turns people into fascists. Uh, so they argue at length, the entire film is about this, their moral qualms about subjecting their children to this kind of, uh, of situation. The, uh, I won't tell you how it ends. Um, so on the side of the Israeli artists, and particularly the filmmakers, there's a lot of reflection on the occupation. It's not as if uh, Larry Abrams depicts much of Israel as living in a dream world of abstraction, and that's particularly true in Tel Aviv, where you could think you were in Miami Beach uh, with a, without missing a beat. Uh, that, uh, as I said, 18 out of 20 of these uh, uh, documentary films were concerned in one way or another with the occupation and with the condition of the Palestinians. Uh, now, on the side of the Palestinians, what's going on? Well, it's impossible for a Palestinian filmmaker to produce a fly-on-the-wall documentary of checkpoints. If you get near them with a the camera, yeah, you are at risk. So, uh, a young filmmaker named Khaled Jarrar, uh, one of the most interesting young people uh, in Ramallah, made the following uh, documentary. It's just 10 minutes long. It's called Journey 110. And this is uh, the world that you pass through if you want to avoid checkpoints. Uh, this uh, Journey 110 is a 110 meter uh, culvert or sewer pipe uh, that, that allows you to uh, bypass the checkpoint that separates Ramallah from Jerusalem. So here's uh, Hala Gerard.
uh, Journey 110 uh, should, uh, to be seen properly, should be seen in, in an art gallery, in a, a black box theater, uh, in which there is absolutely no other light except the light coming from the screen. So you're not really getting uh, the effect of this, you know, marvelous little piece of film. It, uh, and when you see it in a very dark room, you also see one of the properties of video uh, in contrast to cinema, which is that video seeks for light. It, uh, and so darkness is filled with sparkling uh, because, uh, don't ask me to explain the technology, but the, the video camera wants to find light. It's, uh, they're much uh, better for shooting in low light. Um, another kind of angle on the checkpoint is, um, in a much more humorous vein, Sharif Waked's Sheep Point from uh, 2003 is, um, and it answers the question, what, what would a, um, an avant-garde Palestinian fashion show look like, especially for me, uh, men's fashions? Uh, and so uh, this is a kind of parody of the runway uh, video of handsome young models uh, with wonderful bodies parading up and, up and down in the latest fashions. And you can see right away what, uh, in this still, what's going on, instead of the shirt collar framing the neck, this one frames the navel. Uh, and uh, in a second, you'll, I think you'll see why uh, that makes sense. <laughs> This is a, a regular ritual at the checkpoints uh, when Palestinian men and now Palestinian women pass through. It's to check and make sure you're not wearing a suicide belt uh, and ready to blow yourself up. So Waked turned this into a fashion show, which I think also in, in a racialized situation, it, uh, it, you, know, you ask yourself, who's the implied spectator for this fashion? And of course, it is the Israeli border guards who regard, uh, as we've seen, the, the Palestinians as animals, dangerous animals, uh, but also dangerous animals are objects of fascination, sometimes uh, of desire. Uh, so the fashion show, which is about, among other things, erotic fascination, and the, <coughs> the possible glimpse of the naked bodies of Palestinian men, uh, it, it makes a kind of perverse sense. Uh, Waked's uh, video, which uh, goes on for 15, 20 minutes, uh, is really a marvelous send-up of the fashion show. And it expresses another thing I think is crucial about Palestinian art under these desperate conditions, that it's uh, filled with comedy. Uh, the Palestinian sense of humor uh, is, I think, uh, equal in to the, uh, the renowned and famous Jewish sense of humor uh, that it stands against. So moral of the, these, these uh, documentaries is that collaboration, uh, working together between some Israelis and some Palestinians is possible. Uh, this is arguably the most famous instance, and that's what's called the West East Divan, a musical collaboration that was inaugurated by the late Edward Said and Daniel Berenboim. Berenboim, by the way, uh, has become a Palestinian citizen uh, and uh, renounced his Israeli citizenship. Uh, he's been a thorn in the side of uh, the, the, uh, the Israeli right wing for quite a few years now. I, I'm a supporter of the uh, BDS, Boycott, Divest, Sanction uh, movement, but Within that movement, I have to say, that there are debates. <laughs> One debate is over whether um, the, uh, the West East Devon and the collaboration of Said and Berenboim, uh, which is now tragically cut short by Said's death, uh, whether it should be boycotted 
as a form of normalization. So we have lots of internal arguments about this. I'm on the side of the West East Divan myself. Uh, I think uh, this was a great thing they did, and I think Baron Boim continues to do it, even if their rhetoric is kind of uh, involves transcending conflict through the arts. Uh, and I don't think many of these artists are interested in transcending anything. Uh, it strikes me that the best work is what I would call imminent critique, that is, inside of, embedded in the situation. Now, one, I want to step back a little bit to uh, f reframe some of these issues inside of uh, a secondary reflection on uh, the nature of the Palestinian-Israeli relationship. This is Godard's Notre Musique from 2004, and it's a scene in which he uh, ponders the relation of Israel and Palestine, I think, to a very good effect. Godard begins with a comparison of um, <clears throat> photographs of Jewish and Arab identities in the Nazi stereotypes of photographs of Jewish and Arab identities, uh, the Juif and the Musulman, which uh, were interchangeable uh, in the concentration camps in the Holocaust. Musulman or Muslim was simply the name for someone who had lost the will to live and could be Jewish, Muslim, Remember, the Holocaust was aimed just as much uh, at lots of other kinds of people besides Jews. Uh, and historically, Christian anti-Semitism, uh, in the Middle Ages, it didn't make much difference whether you were Jewish or Muslim. You were uh, a Semite. Uh, so anti-Semitism was a, uh, an equal opportunity uh, form of racism. Uh, and you know, it's uncanny that the, the Holocaust reunited these figures of the Jew and, and the Muslim, the Juif and the Musulman. Uh, Godard reflects on this <clears throat> with a bunch of photographs taken in 1948 when Israelis, as he says, get in the water toward the promised land and Palestinians get in the water to drown. Uh, result, the Jewish people become fiction, the Palestinian people become documentary, shot, reverse shot. Godard's linkage of the two peoples to the cinematic formalism of dialogue and intersubjectivity, and to fundamental types of film genres, uh, fiction and documentary, is, is probably a little too neat and, and symmetrical. Uh, as I hope you've noticed, documentary and fiction are present on both sides, and uh, the, the, the typical cinematic representation of dialogue between Palestinians and, and Israelis is rarely conveyed by shot, reverse, shot. This is one place where the in-trans is uh, most evident. You see these uh, films in which the, the other side is seen, the other side may even be heard, but uh, the whole uh, formal structure of shot, reverse, shot is extremely difficult to achieve unless you have some kind of collaboration. Um, so uh, more characteristic in documentaries about the occupation is the portrayal of Palestinians attempting to start a conversation or pleading their case to an impassive uh, soldier who refuses all human conduct. Uh, but there is one film that really, it's as if a, a, Avi Magrabi's film, Avenge But One of My Two Eyes, was made precisely in order to address this. Uh, Magrabi is one of the best uh, uh, the directors in Israel today, and it's a, a, an attempt to build a film around a conversation between an Israeli and Palestinian. We never see the Palestinian. 
but we hear his voice over the phone reporting on the latest military incursions into Ramallah. What we see is the director, Magrabi, in his own home trying in vain to comfort his friend. Uh, these scenes are intercut with TV news footage of the incursions and Mugrabi's own cinematic incursions into the West Bank where he tries to shame border guards into letting Palestinian children pass through their checkpoints on the way to school. He documents other important scenes available only to an Israeli insider such as the settler communities, triumphant festivals complete with racial slurs against the Arabs, and most notable is something I wish I could show you. It is the ominous tourist ritual conducted on the mountaintop at Masada, where guides every day retell the story of the ancient Israelites' refusal to surrender to the Romans and their decision to commit collective suicide rather than be captured and enslaved. This story is then promptly interpreted as an allegory of modern Israel's Samson option or Masada complex. Both of these are uh, phrases you hear uh, bandied about in the uh, discussion of security. The, the tacit warning being that a nuclear armed Israel will never allow itself to be conquered, but will take the world along with it. Magrabi's film is rather modest uh, about the ability of art or the artist to intervene in the deadlock that's is Israel-Palestine, but it does it, he, he films the ritual, which, by the way, I've witnessed it myself. Uh, when my son was 13 years old, we went to Israel, 1987, and witnessed this exact ritual, which yeah, I think must still go on every day. Uh, but uh, Mugrabi captured a moment when there was some pushback from the tourists. Uh, a young Jewish woman questioned the heroic narrative of suicide rather than surrender. She points out that the women and children of Masada did not commit suicide, uh, but were murdered by their men, an act that's directly contrary to Jewish law, which forbids both suicide and murder. Uh, but arguably the most uh, important example, and I've kind of been leading up to this, uh, a film in which the formal requirements of interaction, shot reverse shot, are satisfied, is a film called Five Broken Cameras from 2011 co-directed by uh, Palestinian farmer Ahmad Bernat and Israeli filmmaker Guy Davidi. The division of labor between the two directors is quite intricate and complex. Uh, Bernat is a farmer living in the small West Bank town of Bil Inn, surrounded by Israeli settlements that are encroaching on the town's farm and grazing lands. Uh, Bernat bought a video camera to film his newborn son and spent five years uh, he, he thought he was going to be filming his son growing up, but instead he wound up filming the encroaching uh, colonization of the lands around his village. And I'm going to show you some clips uh, from this. The title of the film, Five Broken Cameras, uh, it, it reflects uh, the simple fact that during this filming, five of his cameras were broken. They kind of punctuate the film. Uh, and they are broken, of course, by the Israelis who don't want their activities filmed. So here uh, is the first clip. <laughs> One thing to notice about this, the, the camera has been broken, uh, but it's still capable of getting something. Uh, and, and so Bernat continued to film uh, as the Israeli border guards arrived to drive off the kids who were trying to tear down the fence. Uh, this is what uh, some people have called the poor image uh, or the precarious image. Uh, the image at the moment of its breakup, when uh, circumstances prevent you from seeing 
and yet that moment of prevention itself becomes uh, something to be represented. Uh, so in some ways that's what Five Broken Cameras is about. It's about the, uh, the peril and difficulty of witnessing uh, and the precarious condition uh, of the filmmaker. Uh, Bernat himself testifies during the film that he said, when I was behind the camera, I felt like I had this armor, like I was invisible and uh, you know, could not be hurt, invulnerable. He said, that was a total illusion on my part because uh, the camera was constantly uh, being attacked. But here's the moment I want you to look at this from the formal standpoint of uh, the shot reverse shot moment. It, this is a moment of an attempted uh, conversation uh, or rapprochement, which of course doesn't get anywhere. <laughs> you notice one very simple formal feature about this. That here's a confrontation in which shot reverse shot uh, was possible because Guy Davidi is on one side and Imad Bernard is on the other. Uh, cameras on both sides, uh, but cameras in a collaborative relationship. Uh, the, the camera behind the Israeli soldiers obviously uh, cannot be carried by a Palestinian. And then finally this clip. The uh, camera is looking directly into the gun barrel of a sniper, an Israeli sniper, and the camera actually saved uh, Bernat's life because the bullet lodged in the camera uh, and uh, it would have gone through his head uh, if he hadn't had the camera up in front of it. So highly recommended, uh, five broken cameras. I think m maybe the best example, certainly for my purposes, of successful and uh, amazing collaboration uh, between an Israeli and Palestinian artist. Uh, this film was nominated for the Academy Award, I think in 2012 or 13, alongside, and it, it was so good uh, that it, Israel tried to claim authorship for it. Uh, they, uh, uh, at least their, uh, their censors had the good taste to say, yeah, we, we want to get the credit for this. And at the same time, another film that this one was definitely uh, pr produced by the Israelis, uh, The Gatekeepers, a documentary which looks at the other side of the sniper rifle, the other side of the, uh, the, the attempt to control, uh, surveil Palestinian lives, uh, I think appropriately shown by this kind of atlas of of screens. This is the, uh, the inner workings of Shin Bet, the uh, inter internal security agency uh, of Israel. Five of the uh, leaders of Shin Bet were interviewed at great length for this film. And 
Every one of them. I mean, they're, they're, these are not nice guys. These are people who order assassinations, uh, who are used to, to murder as a political tactic. Uh, but every one of them had come to exactly the same conclusion, that the occupation and the increasing military pressure on the Palestinians had actually uh, had the effect of reducing Israel's security. It had made uh, Israel much more precarious uh, and endangered than uh, some kind of negotiated settlement. The, the long vanished possibility of a two-state solution uh, it, it possible. Uh, how am I doing for time here? As I said at the beginning, I'm, uh, I could just go on and on, uh, or I can wrap up pretty fast here. Anybody? Well, I don't see anybody leaving yet. If, if you start to leave in groups, then I'll... Uh, uh, I, I, I can't end without the, uh, mentioning Ariella Azale, uh, wonderful uh, uh, kind of Israeli exile, uh, filmmaker, photographic historian, archivist, whose work, uh, I'm dumbstruck with admiration at her work as a historian. She um, uh, has produced the most comprehensive uh, photographic archives of the occupation. And, but this particular work, it's a, uh, a, a short film uh, called Civil Alliance Palestine 1947-48, which goes back into the deep history of uh, the, the occupation, the, the moment of the Nakba uh, and the declaration of Israel's existence, uh, the Declaration of Independence in 48. Uh, of course, the, the myth, uh, the, the kind of Zionist narrative of this moment is that the Palestinians uh, ran away to join the invading Arab armies uh, or they were taking up arms and uh, attempting to kill Jews in their villages. What Azale did was to say, well, what is the evidence in the archives about this? Uh, she believes that archives are a form of the commons uh, that needs constantly to be reclaimed by scholars uh, and historians. She went back to the Haganah archives to find out what was going on all over the countryside in hundreds of villages where uh, Jews and Arabs were living together in 47, 48. Uh, and in place after place, uh, she found that village councils were being held in which the elders, Palestinian elders and the Jewish elders were uh, talking about how to avoid conflict. Uh, it was from Jerusalem, David Ben-Gurion, who was saying, forget about all of these local little negotiations, they're meaningless. We want the Palestinians to leave. And three quarters of a million of them fled. Uh, there was uh, murder, looting, rape. Uh, you know, the Palestinians were driven out. They didn't uh, go over to the other side. Most of them, I mean, because Palestine, remember, has had been on, under occupation for hundreds of years by the Ottoman Empire. As far as they were concerned, this is just another empire. Uh, we know how to get along with empires, but this empire had a dream of a purely Jewish state, the Zionist dream. And at the local levels where people knew each other, uh, that dream was regarded as a fantasy. We want to live with our neighbors. We're all farmers, We're, we live together. So what you see here is a group of Israelis and Palestinians gathered around a table, which is a map of Palestine. They read aloud the Haganah archives uh, about the actual conversations that were going on in 47, 48. And each time a conversation is punctuated by a white tile on that village. As you can see, the conversation is almost at an end and Israel is completely covered with white tiles. Uh, but post 48, the civil chapter of history was erased. Uh, the little that was known of efforts to promote civil treaties was presented in a negative light in the ruling perspective through which civil partnership appears as collaboration, namely an act of national treason. A civil reading of documents recording the mutual efforts collected in the Haganah archive yield a vital picture full of hope in the power of shared life. Uh, so th this modest little work by, I mean, this to me is where scholarship really comes alive when an archive reveals this. But here's 
I want to conclude with a couple of other uh, works that are very modest in intention, and, uh, but I think profound in their meaning. Uh, one is, again, uh, Khaled Jarrar, whose film we saw earlier. Uh, in the absence of a Palestinian state, one thing an artist might do is say, well, let's, ha let's make a passport stamp and pretend we have a state. Uh, art is about pretending, about imagining. And this is uh, a, a stamp is actually in my own passport. Uh, it's also, it isn't just the stamp itself, it's the ritual that goes with it. Uh, Girard, uh, on weekends, will often go to the Ramallah bus station, where usually um, American Palestinians are, uh, their families are arriving, and he invites them to get a, a stamp in their passport. And in one particularly uh, uh, terrific instance of this ritual, uh, father, mother, and teenage son uh, get off the bus. He says, "Can I welcome to Palestine? Can I stamp your passport?" Of course, uh, the teenage son immediately whips out his passport, says, "Sure, go ahead." And then the mother yells at him, "Don't you do that? Uh, don't you know the Israelis are going to give us a hard time if they see that stamp in your passport?" And uh, he starts arguing with his mother, and then, of course, he shames his father. Uh, it's just you know, masculine pride. Dad, you've got to have one too. And of course the father can't be shamed by his son, so he turns over his passport. And they, they walk away, the mother uh, bawling both of them out. Uh, I've never gotten in trouble for having it, but it might be because they, you know, it's in a US passport, who knows. Another uh, piece that I want to look at for a moment is by a young Palestinian painter who uh, emerged as an important artist in Israel, and he is an Israeli Palestinian, name is Asim Abu Shakra. He died very young, age 29, but he was a prodigy as uh, an expressionist painter. And he made a whole series of uh, highly expressive paintings of the Sabra plant. And of course, you know what the symbol of the Sabra plant means. A Sabra is the name of a native-born Israeli, somebody who was born in the Holy Land uh, and supports this claim to being indigenous rather than being an immigrant. Uh, th this became a cult item with Israeli collectors in the 80s and 90s. These paintings now are, uh, fetch enormous prices. Uh, what nobody seems to have noticed is that uh, Abu Shakra uh, very cleverly transplanted his Sabra plants. And they are potted plants. They're not growing out of the ground. Uh, so it's, at the same time, they are gorgeous paintings. They are somewhat ironic commentaries on the notion of native rootedness. They're really about uprooting and transplanting. And here's Abba Ibn, uh, one of the great foreign affairs minister of uh, uh, Israel back in the 70s, uh, with his own uh, private potted plant. So another work uh, by an Israeli artist, Larry Abramson, who I mentioned before, is this abstract piece called uh, El Yakim Chalakim. The title means uh, roughly God will raise up the fragments or the pieces. Uh, it's about putting together uh, in a kind of montage fragments that do not go together. Uh, and it uh, consists of several elements, a kind of Malevich black square, uh, uh, referencing European modernism, a, uh, a skeleton of a what's called the Rose of Jericho. Uh, Larry likes to use all kinds of uh, Israeli plants. Are you holding that up so I can see it? What it says, I can't read it from here. Uh, <laughs> almost done, folks. Anyway, the, uh, the, f the fun of this painting is that Eliakim Kalakim is also the name of what's called the Garbage Pail Kids. Uh, it's also an assemblage of uh, a work of salvage art in which you take a lot of trash and put it together. With, a, with Larry, it's the trash of Western painting and, uh, of course, the crescent uh, signifying Islam. 
all jammed together in a kind of prophetic figure standing at the gates, uh, arms raised like Moses uh, heralding the promised land. So I, this is absolutely the last thing I'll show you, short uh, video, which uh, to me shows why uh, no matter how precarious, how degraded or downtrodden, the Palestinians will never be defeated. Uh, th th this is um, nothing but a television commercial, uh, and you'll see in a moment what it's about. At least I think you will. Okay. <laughs> So if the Palestinians can't have their own land, they'll conquer the moon uh, and uh, plant their flag there. Uh, thank you very much.